So we're going to talk about thermal processes. What's a process? This is where the system interacts with its surroundings. Like in the example that we just did. Any, any, way, any a manner in which a system can interact with its uh, surroundings is called a thermal process. And for all thermal processes, the heat and the work always obey the first law of thermodynamics. Delta U is Q minus W. In this, in this section in the next, we're going to talk about four thermal processes, each with its own uh, set of applications. So we're going to generally consider quasi-static processes that occur slowly um, so that the temperature and the pressure everywhere in the system are uniform at all times. That's the basic assumption. So let's talk first about an isobaric process. Define it, derive the work done during an isobaric process. An isobaric process is one that is carried out at constant pressure. Uh, we already talked about um, applying the ideal gas law to um, processes with constant pressure, constant volume, etc. cetera. This, uh, that, that concept still applies here. Um, but we're going to add more information to, to what we've done in that previous concept. So we're, we're interested now in, in a process that's carried out at constant pressure. Iso means same. Bear means, or bar, means pressure. So it just means same pressure. So one example of an isobaric pressure uh, a process would be you take um, a cylinder and you have some gas in that cylinder and you have a movable piston on top of it and you put a weight on top of that piston. What that weight does is it guarantees that the pressure inside that system remains constant. But then if you heat it from below, you're adding heat, it's, it's going to expand as you heat it. So here's uh, at, uh, at a higher temperature and a higher volume, but we still have the same pressure because this, this piston and this mass are still the same as before. And so they're guaranteeing that the pressure initially equals the pressure in the gas finally. That's what we mean by an isobaric process. So we're asked to uh, derive the work done by uh, during an isobaric process. Well, how do we do that? We only know how to do work, um, the work done by a constant force in, in making a displacement S. That's concept 6-1. It's been a little while since we talked about that, but I think you'll remember that the work is a force times the distance times the cosine of the angle. And that angle is between the, the displacement and the force. If the force and the displacement are in the same direction, you get a positive amount of work. The angle is zero and the, the work is positive. If the work and the displacement are perpendicular to each other, I'm sorry, if the force and the displacement are perpendicular to each other, you get no work. And then finally, if the f force and the displacement are opposite each other, you get a negative amount of work. You'll remember that. So in this particular case, we've got a force on this piston that looks like this. Now that force is exerted by the gas on the piston. So the gas is going to be doing work to raise that piston. And Recalling that uh, the pressure is the force per unit area, that's concept 11-12. That just simply means that the force is the pressure times the area. So that's this force right here exerted by the gas on that movable piston. So I've replaced the force here with the pressure um, times the area that we just derived. S is the displacement, and luckily it's in the direction of the force. Here's the force direction. It's up. The displacement is up. 
the angle between these two vec vectors is zero. So we'll have the cosine of zero degrees, which will give me one. And then um, I'd like to point out that the area times the displacement. That's the cross-sectional area of this piston times the displacement. Well, that's just the volume of a cylinder of, of uh, cross-sectional area A and height S. And the volume of that cylinder is, is the cross-sectional area times the height. That's just the volume. So this becomes a change in the volume that, um, that has resulted from the work being done on that gas. That gas, I'm sorry, the work being done by the gas on the piston pushes the piston up uh, and the volume of the gas changes as a result. So this delta V represents the change in volume. P is the pressure of the gas. But we've been told that that pressure is, is constant. It's not changing during that process, an isobaric process. And the work done is P times delta V. And as we said before, the work done by the system is positive when the volume increases. The same idea is, is with a, a force and a displacement. It's positive if the force is in the direction of the displacement. Uh, zero if the... Uh, it's negative when the volume decreases. So that would be that the force is in the direction opposite the displacement. In that, in that case, if we'd started here and gone down to there, the displacement look, would have looked like this, but the, but the pressure or the force exerted by the gas is still upward. The displacement is downward, and we get a negative amount of work done. And then the work uh, done will be zero when the volume remains constant. An example, a gram of liquid water is placed in a cylinder and the pressure is maintained at 2 times 10 to the 5th pascals. The temperature of the water is raised by 31 degrees. So it's the same kind of scenario we talked about before. I'm going to increase the temperature from, well, we don't know what it, what it started with and what it ended with, but we do know how much it changed by, and that's all that matters. And then we're we're told that the water expands by this tiny amount. Water doesn't expand very much when you heat it, not like a gas does. So the work done is going to be the pressure, and we're told that that pressure is 2 times 10 to, 10 to the 5th pascals, times the change in volume. We're given the change in volume. We just plug it in. So that work done by the, not the gas, but by the water, the liquid water, is 0 0.002 joules. Then we know that we're adding some heat to the water because we have to add heat to raise its temperature. So this is the heat added. And we can appeal to concept 12-7, where M is the mass of the water, C is the specific heat capacity of the water, and delta T is the change in temperature. So the mass, we're told, is 1 gram, which is 0 0.001 kilograms. Um, the specific heat capacity of water is 4186 joules per kilogram degree C. Uh, times 31 degrees C, the, the ca uh, C's cancel, the kilograms cancel, we end up with 130 joules needed to raise the temperature of that water by 31 degrees. And then finally, the change in the uh, internal energy of that liquid water is Q, uh, the heat added, 130 joules, minus W, 0 0.002 joules is 130 joules, um, just because this W is such a tiny number that most of the change in the internal energy comes from the heat added rather than uh, from the work done. Now, it's really 130 joules minus a little tiny bit. Now, had we done this experiment with 
uh, with um, gas, with air, for example, instead of water, then this um, change in volume might have been much bigger and the work done might have been greater and played a bigger role. So let's define an isochoric process. Iso means same, choric means volume. So an isochoric process is one that's carried out a constant volume and the work done is zero. How do you know that? Well, we just went through it uh, two slides ago. The work done is positive when the volume increases, negative when it decreases, and zero when it remains constant. If the volume is constant, you're not going to get any work done. So the work done is actually just zero, and that's the end of the story. Now, I'd like to um, talk a little bit, go back to the isobaric process. These pressure plotted as a function of volume are helpful in understanding the work done. So you put pressure on the vertical axis, volume on the horizontal axis, and then you say, well, I'm increasing the volume from the initial volume Vi to final volume delta uh, v Vf. Delta V is V final minus V initial. And in this particular case, it's positive because the volume is increasing. The final is greater than the initial. So here in this plot, here's the final volume, here's the initial volume. And what you notice here is that the work being the pressure times the change in volume is actually just the area under this curve. Initial, this is my initial point here. The pressure is whatever it is. But since it's an isobaric process, the, pr the initial pressure is the same as the final pressure. And this delta V is the um, horizontal extent, and P is the vertical extent, and the, the, the product of those two just gives you the work. So it's the area underneath that curve. Now notice, in the case of an isochoric process, an isochoric process is carried out at constant volume. So the initial and the final volumes are the same. But the pressure is, is changing. So an example of an isochoric process would be uh, that you have a closed cylinder. Instead of having a moving, movable piston on the top, you've got a can of um, Campbell soup or whatever. And you're heating it from below. And what's going to happen, uh, since it doesn't, uh, it can't expand and the volume is, is constant, is it's just going to get hotter. And, um, and the pressure is going to go up vertically like that. But notice that since there's no change in volume, that, that's kind of like a force where there's no displacement. It doesn't do any work. And so the work done is going to be zero. The area under this graph is zero. It's just a vertical line. It doesn't create any area underneath it. So that's another way of looking at the uh, work done. So state the relationship. So this just codifies what we've talked about. Uh, state the relationship between the work done and the pressure volume graph. Um, the short answer is the work done for any process is the area under the pressure volume graph. No big deal there. So uh, if you had a process that looked like this, we're plotting pressure on the vertical axis, volume on the horizontal axis, and if this is my initial state and this is my final state, then the work done by the gas or by the system in this case is the area under this graph. So. Uh, so for this example, we're, gonna, we're supposed to find the work done for a process in which the pressure, volume, and temperature of a gas are changed along a straight line from X to Y here. So since the volume increases, the work is positive. And remember, if the volume's increasing, that's like a force that's in the direction of the displacement where the work is positive. Um, 
and we've increased from this initial volume to this final volume. And uh, we're told that each of these squares uh, has, so the, the height of each square is 2 times 10 to the fifth pascals, and the horizontal extent of each square from here to here is 1 times 10 to the minus 4 cubic meters. We can find the total area by just counting the number of squares. And I count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Um, but then this one wasn't a complete square, so it's a little bit less than 9, but this one's a little bit more. So uh, we can estimate it maybe about 8 or 9 um, squares in all. It's just a rough estimate. Um, times the pressure, times the, uh, well, that's this pressure for each uh, unit of, of uh, increase of pressure for each little unit square. And then this is the volume change for each little unit square, which will give us 180 joules uh, under that curve.